I'm going to have you open up to the book of Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17. The book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, and this morning I want to talk to you about something pretty basic and practical, but I think, I believe to be essential, but I want to talk to you about the effects of the Word of God, the effects of the Word of God, and how this book has positive and yet negative effects throughout history. There's been people who died for the Bible, then there's been people who burned the Bible and tried to destroy the Word of God. But the Word of God has, a, has an effect in everybody's life. It could be positive and it could be negative. No matter who you are as a human being, the, the Word of God is going to be expressed to you at one point or time and another in your life. God is going to try to use His Word to reveal Himself to you through the Word of God. God has always revealed himself through the pages of scripture down through history. If you study the word of God, you can go all the way back to the laws and the commandments of Moses. If you study the word of God, you can go all the way back to different ways where God would show the people of Israel who he was. But throughout history, people always had a different effect in the word of God. The word of God had a different effect in people's lives. And when we come to Acts chapter 17, we see two different effects in people's lives in the word of God. And we have to realize down through history that there has been people who literally have fallen in love with the word of God. And then down through history, there has been people that hated and hated the very word of God. Different leaders and different kings and different parts of the world. People that just have such a deep hatred for the word of God. And then you'll find other people that in other parts of the world that had a deep love and a deep passion and a deep conviction for the very word of God. You'll see other people that have no concern whatsoever well, but that's still an effect. They don't believe it. They don't listen to it. They can't hear it. They can't process it. They can't even understand it. So the word of God has a, a, a multiple, multiple effect in people's lives. And the question is, is how is the word of God affecting you as a child of God this morning? How is the word of God impacting your life? What is the word of God doing to you as a child of God? How is it literally taking life and root inside of you as a child of God? How is it transforming you? How is it strengthening you? How is it building you? How is it sustaining you as a child of God? What effect is the word of God having inside of you as a very child of God? Now this book should have a, a predominant effect in your life. The word of God should have more effect in your life in a positive sense than anything else in the world. If you want understand what you have in your hands and if you understand what God has given you and you have faith in God's word and you understand the power that is behind the word of God let me tell you something that word is the most important thing in your life can I get an amen on that word it's the most significant thing in your life is because it's what sustains you it's what strengthens you and it's what secures you and it's what gets you through all of this life and all that life has to face now, if you were to look, I'm going to give you a couple answers, then we'll get into the thrust of the message, a couple examples, and then we'll get into the thrust of the message. So down through history, people have always tried to destroy the word of God. We know that. They've tried to annihilate the scriptures. They tried to kill Christianity. They took Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity, and they nailed him to a cross and crucified him. They took all of the apostles and killed each and every one of them. Why? It's because they were proclaiming the word of God. Down through history, people have always hated the word of God. We're living in a society right now, today, where people, ultimately, they hate the word of God. They hate this book for what it stands for. They hate this book because the word exposes everything in this evil world. They hate this word of God because it is truth and people don't want to hear or to believe the very truth of God's word. So if you were to look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 1, and look at this. Now when they had passed through Amphilius and Antilopia, they came to Thessalonica, where, where was the synagogue of the Jews. Now watch what happens here. And Paul, as his manner was, he went into, the, into unto them, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the what? Out of the scriptures. So the apostle Paul was going back to the Old Testament. He was showing the Jewish people that Jesus Christ 
was the Son of God. He was using illustration after illustration from the Old Testament, confirming that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Maybe he used Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham took Isaac up and offered it was going to offer him up. Maybe he used that portion of Scripture. Maybe he used the scapegoat in the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Maybe he gave them illustration about the Passover lamb. Whatever it was, we're not sure in the Word of God, but he was taking them through the Old Testament and he was confirming to them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God. He was using the Scriptures to do this. Now, once again, this is, these are Jewish people. You would think that they would be enthralled in hearing the truth on how those Old Testament scriptures apply. You would think they would be ecstatic. You'd think they would be excited about it, but not necessarily so. We're going to see the results and the response of the Word of God, how the Word of God affects people in any type of society, any type of world. Now watch this, right? And Paul goes in and three, uh, he's there for three weeks, Sabbath, all right? Days reasoning with them out of the scriptures. He's going back and forth. He's reasoning with them, showing them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. You see that? So I'm sure he took him to the Passover lamb. I'm sure he took him to the scapegoat and to the sacrificial goat. I'm sure Paul took them through, through the life of Joseph and several other portions of Scripture showing that Jesus Christ must suffer. Now watch this. And reasoning again from the dead, and rising again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I have preached unto you is Christ. Now watch this. And when some of them, both this, and some of them believed and, and, and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude of the chief women. So there was a lot of people that took what Paul said and they believed the word of God. They received it and they believed it. Now watch what happens here, right? Because we have to deal with this issue about some people believing and then other people not believing. Now watch this, right? So he's opening the scriptures, verse 3. He's showing them that Jesus Christ is God. He had to suffer. And it says in verse 4, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas of the vote, great, great, multiple, uh, multi, I'm sorry, multitude, and of the chief women, not few. So there was a bunch of women that believed, a bunch of men that believed, Jewish people, but the Jews which believed not. Now watch what happens. They moved with envy. And took unto them certain lewd fellows of, of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in a what? In an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now notice this. So you have a group of people that believe. Then you have another group of people that are just literally in an uproar. Have you ever realized what this King James Bible has done throughout history? A lot of Christians don't know anything about history, but if you study anything about history, there were people that were tortured and killed for your Bible. There were people down through history. There's a book. There's a little book. It's called The Trail of Blood. How many guys have seen that? Anyone have seen that? It's called The Trail of Blood. And, and there's only two people that have seen that. You got, I urge you to get it. How many guys have seen it? To show you. Okay, good. Those guys, get that book, The Trail of Blood, and it'll show you down through history about Christians and people that were being tortured for your Bible. And it wasn't a new King James, and it wasn't an NIV or an ASV. It was the authority of God's word in the 1611 AV. Amen. Authorized version. Now, people don't realize this, that this book has such an effect in society. It has an effect in the culture. It has an effect in individuals' lives. And sometimes it's positive, and sometimes it's negative. These are the things that we have to deal with, the, the effects of the word of God. Sometimes you're going to get out there and start witnessing to people and they're going to become so agitated and, and, and irate with you that they'll start yelling and screaming at you. And say, Pastor Mike, that's never happened to me. Well, because you're not witnessing enough. I'll tell you that. Amen. You get out there, you start witnessing enough, Amen. and you're going to see how people become infuriated with the word of God, how they hate the word of God. Yeah. Now watch this, right? But the Jews, which believe not, we see they move with envy. They look, took unto them lewd fellows. They caused up, they made a whole, they literally made a riot. All right, lewd fellows of the, of the base of sword and gathered the company and set all the city in an uproar. They formed a riot because of Paul going
going into the synagogue and preaching. That was the negative effect in those people's lives. They didn't want anything to do with the word of God. They didn't want anything to do with the truth. They didn't want the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. They didn't want anything to do with it. And they stirred up a whole city. Now watch what happens here, right? And they, you know, they Jason, they pull them out. Now watch it, verse 6. And when they found them not, they, they drew Jason and a certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, watch this. These that have turned the world, say it out loud, upside, upside down. down are come hither also. <laughs> He's like, those people, those Christians are making a mess of the world. No. They were the ones that were turning it upside right and trying to fix it, right? They were the ones that were bringing the truth. They were the ones that showing the people the way of salvation. But notice the hatred for the word of God. We live in a society, in a country, we live in a culture where people hate the word of God. They hate it. Men love darkness rather than light because what? Their deeds are evil. They hate the word of God. It's a book that has been hated. Let me give you a couple other illustrations. You don't need to turn there. I'll paraphrase it. But in the book of Jeremiah chapter 36, most of you probably do know the story. In Jeremiah chapter 36, Jeremiah receives the word from God and Baruch receives the word from God and they bring it to the king. And the king's reading the word of God, but he's reading that if they repent and turn back to God, God's grace will come upon them. But if they don't repent, God's judgment would come upon them. And so he's reading it. They give it to him. He looks at it. He's like, I don't like this message. He takes a knife and he cuts it. And then what does he do? He throws it in the fire. He's like, I don't like this book. I don't like what this prophet has to say. I don't like what this preacher has to convey. I don't like this negative message. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut it up and I'm going to throw it in the fire. And then you know the story. God says, well, let's rewrite it. Let's do it. There you have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God showing you a beautiful inspiration of the scriptures. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. Now, here's another illustration. This is a contrast of the one I just showed you. Over in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Now we see that Nehemiah and the individuals, they all get up and they begin to read out of the book of the law. Now, this is an awesome response because it says that the people began to weep. They began to tremble and they stood and they had a fear and a great reverence for the word of God. Now, you have two individuals. One individual cuts the word of God up, throws it in the fire. Then you have the other people down there in the book of Nehemiah. What were they doing? Man, they fell under conviction of the spirit of God. They were filled with fear. They were weeping. They were crying. They had a positive response to the word of God. Okay. <clears throat> Now turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now watch this, right? For this cause also we, we, uh, we thank, I'm sorry. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Because that when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, watch this, Paul's writing, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, now watch this, which, say it out loud, what? Effectually, Effectually all right, worketh also in you that what? Believe. Believe. You see that? So what does the word of God do? It has an, an effect in your life. See, the more you expose yourself to the word of God, that book is having an effect in you, if only if you believe, though. If you don't believe, there's no effect, right? If you don't believe and you don't fall in love with God's word, there is absolutely no effect in your life. You can read it. You can listen to it. You can be a hearer of the word and yet never a doer of the word. Amen. Deceiving your own selves. So somebody who truly believes the word of God, it has an impact in their life. It has a transformation. It does something in you. Just as we've seen. With the king in, Jer in Jeremiah chapter 36, he heard the word of God, and man, he got so mad, he took a knife, he cut it, and threw it into the fire. He hated the book. He didn't want anything to do with it. And then the people in Nehemiah, what did they do? They stood, and they had the fear of God. The people were weeping and crying. The word of God had such an impact in their life that it literally transcended them as a people and as a culture. The word of God had such a powerful impact in their lives that it literally changed them. Now watch this. We ask ourselves, well, well, how can a book have such an effect in my life? 
Well, first of all, it's not just a book, right? Amen. We have a more sure word of what? Prophecy. A more sure word. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. Listen, guys, the God who created the universe, who spoke the stars into existence, who spoke this world into existence, he has anointed his word. It's the most important thing in this world is the word of God. The word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Job says, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The word of God is life. God has literally breathed life into his word. And for the people who believe it, man, it's like a supernatural power. It's a supernatural antidote in their life. I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. But let's look at this, right? For this cause, <clears throat> also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word, look at this, not of the word of men. This book was inspired, and it was inspired by God himself. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But as it is, look at this, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the word of God, it has an, an effect in you that believe. It changes you. It does something inside of you. Watch this. For ye brethren, look at this, this is the result of the word of God in their life. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, are, are in Christ Jesus. I ye also suffered like things of the own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So what happened to the word of God in their life? It resulted in being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, if you know anything about church history, and if you've ever read the book of Acts, what did it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ back then, historically? It meant nine out of ten times, you were going to have to die as a martyr of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, it was their conviction in the word of God, and their faith was so strong, it gave them such a belief that they literally would be willing to give their lives for Jesus Christ. Because their conviction and their faith was so strong. You know what the Word of God does? It brings a conviction out inside of you. If you think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Ezra, Ezariah, and Meshach, you think about those three Hebrew boys. Nebuchadnezzar says, we're going to throw you in the fire. They're like, that's okay. Amen. You're going to throw us in the fire? We don't care because we trust God. And if God doesn't deliver us, so be it. But if he does, we're still not going to bow to your image. Amen. We're not going to do it. Because they had faith in what God said in his word. You see, true belief in Jesus Christ, true faith in God, it brings out a conviction in your life. Now watch this, right? If you have faith and belief, because it affects everybody differently. Some people, they come to hear me preach, they're like, I never want to go ahead and that guy ever again. <laughs> because it affects them differently. I had one individual tell me one Sunday and one, he goes, man, he goes, he goes, it was different what you said. He goes, but Pastor Mike, I have to be honest, I'm one of them God haters. <clears throat> That's how that was the effect that the word of God had in his life. I said to him, I said, you know something? Thank you for being honest. <laughs> That's what I told him. I go, at least you're honest. Amen. Now let's look at this, right? Because I want to show you some different things here about what the word of God does. Turn to Psalm 19. Okay? Turn to Psalm 19. Now, you have to understand, historically speaking, if you study the life of David, the great psalmist, David wrote Psalm 119. He wrote the majority of the psalms. The majority of the psalms and the songs and the things that David had written, they were all pertaining to the word of God in his life. David had a relationship with God through the word of God. Does everyone understand that? David had an intimacy with God, and it was based on the laws and the commandments of God. David didn't even have the, the compiled scriptures that we have. David was reading the first five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And you know what he did? He established a relationship and faith in God through that. See, the word of God had such a profound effect in David's life. It gave him the ability to face the giant. The word of God had such a profound effect in David's life that David became one of the greatest kings in all of Israel. The word of God had such a profound effect in him. As a young boy, he defeated a bear, he defeated a lion, and then he defeated a giant because of the word of God sustaining him and strengthening him. 
the word of God did something inside of him. Why? It's because he believed it with all of his heart and all of his mind and all of his soul. So it had a positive effect in the life of David. Now notice what David writes here in Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. It's perfect. It's without flaw. It's without error. And only the King James Bible is that. Amen. Only the King James Bible is Amen. perfect. Amen. Every other translation is perverted and it's corrupt and it's distorted. The, Lord, the words of the Lord are what? They're pure. God has tried them in the furnace of the earth seven times. It's pure, man. We've got a pure word of God. Now watch this. The law of the Lord is, what is it? It's perfect. And what does it do? Converting the what? Did you guys get that? Sometimes we read that and we're just like, okay, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, but we don't really ponder on it. Well, what is your soul? Your soul is who you really are. Your soul is your inner being. It's who and what you really are. It's the eternal part of you that connects with God. Your soul is the existence of your emotions, your inner being, your who you exist, your thoughts, the intents of everything of your heart. Now notice what it says, that the law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? It converts the soul. Now, not only does it convert the soul in salvation, we understand that, right? You need the word of God to get saved. Do you guys all understand that? The Bible says being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of a what? Incorruptible seed by the what? Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's the word of God that transforms us and that brings salvation. Does everyone understand that? The word of God in the, in the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Matthew with the soul. It was the word of God that brings salvation to somebody. You got saved by reading the word of God. You got saved by hearing the message. You got saved by hearing the preaching. You got saved by the word of God itself. It took residence inside of you. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. Now watch this. So the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It converts the soul in salvation. But not only in salvation. You know what this book does? It changes the way you think. It changes who you are. The word of God literally transforms you as a child of God. Only if you believe, though. Some people say, I believe the word of God. I don't see any changes in your life. Do you really believe? I don't see any transformation in your life. I don't see any literally transformation. I don't see any converting of the soul where God has reached out deep into your heart and deep into your life and got such a strong hold of you that it changes the way you think. It changes the way you see the world. It changes the way you see people. It changes the way you speak. And it changes every aspect about you. That's what it means. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. It changes you as an individual. See, it works what? Effectively in them that what? Believe. Then he goes on. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the what? The simple. I mean, you could be as dumb as a stump. That book will make you wise. Amen. You can be as dumb as can be. But that book will give you more common sense than some PhD that got in some sort of degree. Come on, Amen. That's right. It's kind of funny the way we think, you know, we look at people and say, man, that person is intelligent. If they're not born again, they're a fool. Amen. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Listen, guys, you can have all types of degrees. You can have all types of education. That doesn't mean anything. As old Dr. Ruckman used to say, education without salvation is what? Damnation. Damnation. Amen. This book will make you smile. Now, some of you need it a little bit more than others. Sure did. Amen, brother. That starts with me. I'm second. Amen. Because I struggled all through school. I was in a special needs class. I mean, I had the, 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 the school bus that used to pick me up. And it wasn't bad with the helmet in my head. And I'd drive to school. I'd be driving through Holbrook like this. And then I'd finally get out. I'd finally get into the other town where nobody knew me. And I could lift my head up and take my helmet off. But guys, understand this, right? The word of God will give you wisdom. It'll give you knowledge. It'll give you understanding. It'll give you comprehension. It'll help you get through your struggles and adversities and hurt and pain and despair. That's why God's given us his word. It converts our soul in the area of salvation, but it transforms us in the area of confirmation, transforming us into the very image of Christ. Look at this. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, 
They're right. Nothing's ever wrong with that book. Rejoicing the heart. I mean, you see that? Guys, you ever read that book and it makes your heart rejoice? Amen. When you ever, you, I mean, some of us have gone through some hurt and some dark pain and some deep sorrows in our life, and you find yourself reading the scriptures, right? And all of a sudden, you can feel that rejoicing of the heart when God begins to rejuvenate you in some of the darkest times in your life, in some of the most hurt and pain and discouragement times in your life. You get into God's word, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God, through the word of God, begins to bring your heart to rejoicing. The statutes of the law, right? Rejoicing the heart. You see that? God's word will rejoice your heart, people. People are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Listen, joy, the joy of the Lord is our what? Is our strength. It comes from the Lord. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, look at this, is pure. I love this next word. It says, enlightening the what? Enlightening the eyes, man. You know what God does? God gives you the ability to see things that clearly. God gives you the ability to discern what is right, to discern what is wrong. God will reveal to you his will, his power, his purpose, his plan. God will enlighten your eyes through the word of God. Through thy precepts, I get understanding. How many of you have read Psalm 119 here? Put your hand up. You need to go back, study it up. Psalm 119, it shows us the relationship that David had with the word of God. And if David, a man of God, a man that was after God's own heart, had a relationship with God, I want to go back and I want to see the heart of David because David had a relationship with the scriptures, with the word of God. David was faced with all types of adversity, but he had a strong relationship with God and his word. And the law of the Lord was what? It was converting his soul. It was strengthening him. The testimonies of the Lord, they were sure making wise the simple. You know, David was a young man and he was leading people into battle. David was leading Saul's army into battle. at the. He was probably still in his teens. Leading men that were old enough to be his father into battle. You know what the Bible says about David? He behaved himself what? Wisely. More than anybody. Because of the word of God in his life. You get away from this book, I'm telling you right now, Christian, you will lose your mind, literally. Did everyone hear that? If you miss everything I'm telling you right now, the further you get from this book, the crazier your mind will become. Now watch this, right? Let's try to get into the message to the thrust of it now. So we see that the commandment of the Lord is pure. What does it do? Enlightening the eyes. God's word gives us enlightenment. It gives us a revelation. It gives us a comprehension. It, listen, it allows you to see what's happening in the world today. The word of God enlightens your eyes about history, about humanity. The word of God enlightens your eyes about everything you need to see in this world. You want to see things through God's eyes. Now, turn to the book of Hebrews. We all know this scripture, but I want us to look at it because we're talking about the effects of the word of God. I gave you a couple of illustrations that certain people hate the word of God. All right? We already seen that. And the funny thing is, is I've talked to supposable Christians that hate the King James Bible. You ever scratch my head and go, what is up with this person? Now watch this. The effects of the word of God. Now watch this. For the word of God, it's what is it first of all, people? Is everyone with me? It's what? Oh, Hebrews 4.12. <laughs> you guys all know the scriptures anyway. Come on. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is what? It's quick. That means it's alive. Okay? Does everyone understand that? That this is not just a book written by man. Holy men of God spake that they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But the word of God is quick. It means it's alive. It means that it has power to it. It means that it has substance to it. It means that it has life to it. And when you receive it, you receive life. Amen. This book is living, man. And you know what it's been doing? It's been moving down through history. It's been moving down through history. Old Mel Sabaki used to say they would get out the street preach. Brother Mike, this would maybe be good for you. Is, is they would take a box and they would put it over a Bible. And they would have it and it would say, it's alive. And they would be, it's alive, it's alive. And people would gather around, what's under the box, it's alive. And they'd lift it up and it'd be the Bible. Amen. Amen. And then they'd use that as a witnessing tool. Guys, that book is alive. Man. Sure is. You know what it does? It gives you life. It's alive. For the word of God, it's quick, it's alive. Now watch this, and it's powerful. Well, wait a second. 
It's the most powerful thing in the universe is the spoken word of God. You think you got strong? He, guys, listen, God spoke this world into existence. By the word of God, we live, we breathe, and we move, and we have our being. The word of God is powerful. It's alive and it's powerful. And I love this, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You see that? That book is like a sword, man. It cuts, it slashes, it pierces people. That's why they hate it. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing a so asunder of soul and of spirit and of joints and marrow. Now watch this, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know what that book does? It tells you what's inside of you. That's why people hate it. Because you know what it does? It discerns what's inside of you. And you look at that and you start reading it, you're like, oh, I don't like that. That thing's talking about me. Yeah, it's talking about you and it's talking about me. Oh man, and that's why people hate it. That's why people don't want to read it. That's why people don't want to study it. And that's why it has a negative effect in some people's lives. In Jeremiah 36, the king looked at that thing. He looked at the book, Jeremiah, what the bird should say. And he just said, I don't like this. I'm going to cut it up. I'm going to rip it up and throw it in the fire. How about what happened with Stephen in Acts chapter six, uh, Acts chapter seven? You guys know the story. Stephen was given a discourse of the Old Testament to the nation of Israel, and it says they hated him so much. It says they were cut to the heart, and it was the word and the message that Stephen was preaching. It brought such conviction in their life and such hatred. They picked up stones and they stoned him to death. People hate the word of God. Because it cuts, it convicts, it reveals the intent of man's heart. Now watch this, look at verse 13, right? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, meaning the word of God, but all things are what? Naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. You know something? That book exposes everything inside of you. You and I are completely bare and naked before the word of God. That book knows your thoughts. It knows the intents of your heart better than you know the thoughts and the intents of your own heart. That's a scary thought, isn't it? That the word of God knows your um, uh, emotions. It knows your thoughts. It knows the intents of the heart. The word of God knows more about you than you know about you. Now let's look at this a little bit further. Go to Psalm 119. Okay, Psalm 119 and verse 98. Psalm 119 verse 98. Now watch what David says here, okay? Now think of the historical background of David and all he became at a very young age, okay? So look what it says here. David writes this in Psalm 119, verse 98 through 100. He says, look at this. Uh, through, thy, uh, through thy commandments, has, thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies. Now pause there for a minute. David had multiple enemies, okay? Saul the king of Israel was one of David's enemies. David had enemies in the Philistines that literally wanted him dead. Everywhere David went, he had people, his life was always in danger and in jeopardy because of the word of God. Now notice what David says here. He says, look at this, though thy commandments, thou hast made me wiser than my enemies. It was the word of God that gave, that gave David the wisdom and the knowledge to defeat and to overcome his enemies. You wanna know why that book is so important in your life? You've got an enemy, the adversary, the devil. And without that book, you will never have victory over him. But watch this. For they are ever with me, meaning the word of God. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Now watch what he says. For thy testimonies are my what? Meditation. David says, I have more understanding. Is he being arrogant? Is he being cocky? No. He's conveying what God has revealed to him. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Well, why, David? Why did you have more understanding than all your teachers? And he answers it in the latter part of verse 99. For thy testimonies are my what? Meditation. I understand more than the ancient because I what? Keep thy precepts. The word of God is so important in your life that sometimes I can't even express it in human words. I know a lot of Christians, you know, they come to church, praise God, but they don't understand 
how important the word of God is to them. You are saved by the word of God. You are secure by the word of God. And you are sustained by the word of God. The word of God is what's going to bring stability in your life. It's what's going to be strength in your life. And anyone can testify to, in this room if they've seen somebody get away from the word of God where their state of mind goes. <coughs> If you've seen somebody, even maybe even in your own self, you get away from that book, you get away from the truth, and all of a sudden, your mind starts to go a little haywire, doesn't it? It was the word of God that sustained David. It was the word of God that strengthened David. It was the word of God that gave him the fortitude and the strength to face the bear, the lion, and the, and the giant. It was the word of God that gave David the ability to face battle after battle after battle. It was the word of God that strengthened David to be the great leader and to be the great king that he was. It was the word of God that literally sustained every aspect of his life. Okay. Now, let's turn back to the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy. Let's see if we can tie all of this together now. Now watch this, let's tie all this together. Deuteronomy chapter four and verse five, Deuteronomy chapter four and verse five. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do, ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Now watch this. Moses tells the people of Israel, keep therefore and do them. Now what does it say? For this is your what? This is your wisdom. You see that? The word of God was the very wisdom that God gave to his people. It was the wisdom how, how to overcome. It was the wisdom on how to face adversity and trials and tribulation. It was the wisdom on how to go into the wilderness and face everything that they had to face as a nation. It was the wisdom that had to establish them as a nation and literally worship and serve God. God gave them wisdom. The Bible says that out of his mouth goeth wisdom. The most important thing you can establish is wisdom because you're going to need wisdom on how to raise your kids. You're going to need wisdom on how to deal with adversity and conflict. You're going to need wisdom on how to witness and make a difference in people's lives. You're going to need wisdom on how to disciple people and get involved in things like that. You're going to need the very wisdom of God in all of these areas. He says, keep therefore and do them. The word of God, for this is your wisdom. And what does he say? In your understanding. Now watch this, in the sight of the nations. That's where we were as a country early on in this country. A country that was filled with the word of God, the knowledge of God, the great revivals, the great preaching, the great evangelists. And we were strengthened as a nation. Watch this. What shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. God told his people, your word is going to set you apart from every other nation. The word that I'm giving you is going to establish you with strength. It's going to establish you with wisdom. All of those other nations were living in debauchery and morality and perverseness, worshiping false gods and false images and false deities. That's what they were doing. God says, you people are going to be a light unto me. My word is going to have such a profound effect in you as the people of God. See, the word of God is going to have an effect in your life one way or another. Let's look at one more portion of scripture. We'll tie it together with this. Turn to Acts chapter 17. <coughs> Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Now let's see what happens here. Pertaining once again to the word of God. How it affects certain people. It had a great effect in these individuals' lives. Now watch this. These, the Bereans, they were more, watch this, these, these, Acts chapter 17 verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And look at this. And what did they do? They what? 
They searched the scriptures daily. See that? Whether those things were so. You know what these people did? They heard the word of God. They responded in a positive sense. And it says, they searched the scriptures daily. It became a daily part of their life. They searched the scriptures over. They went through it over and over and over and over again. Why? It's because they were more noble. The effect that the word of God had in their life, you know what it did? It transformed them. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Say it out loud. Converting the what? Converting the soul. Converting the soul. You believe that book, it's going to change you. It's going to transform you. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now watch this. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not few. You know what this word of God did? It had such an impact in their life that it caused them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. Everyone you witness to is, is going to have a different reflecting of the word of God. The book is going to impact everybody differently. Some people positively, some people negatively, some people it's going to become more confusing. And listen, everybody's going to be different. My question to you this morning is, how has God's word affected you? What has God's word done in your life as a child of God? Has it converted your soul? Has it transformed you? Has it enlightened your eyes? Has it given you the ability to win souls? The Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that wins souls is what? Wise. Is wise. Has the word of God had such a profound effect in your life? Because that Bible says that it works what? Effectually in them that what? In them that believe. It changes you. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you see the world. It changes what's inside of you. It changes the way you see people. It changes the way you see yourself. It changes everything. It changes the way you see the world and human history. It changes the way you look at everything in life. Because what does it do? It enlightens your eyes. And you see everything the way the Holy Spirit of God wants you to see it. You see this world the way God wants you to see it. You see everything clearly the way God wants you to see it. Let's bow as for prayer. Lord, we come before you. We thank you and praise you for the word of God that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the King James Bible, the authorized version, 1611. Lord, the inspired word of God. Lord, no other book has been inspired. Not the New King James, the RSB, the ASB. Nothing else has ever been inspired outside of your word, the King James Bible. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, you said that your, the word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And Lord, we pray, God, that the power of the word of God change us this morning, each and every one of us, starting with me. Lord, I pray, God, for the power of the written word of God convert me and to change me and to change everyone in this room. I pray, God, that the word of God will have a positive effect in our hearts and in our lives this morning. That we will never be the same. And Lord, I pray, God, that the word of God will enlighten our eyes. And that the word of God will take us simple people and make us wise. And Lord, we just thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that you've chosen to give us an inspired word that will give us strength, security, stability. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a book that will rejoice our heart in a time of sorrow and hurt. Lord, we thank you, God, for all the examples that you've given to us. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you'd help us to meditate ponder on the word of God throughout the day that the book of the law will not depart out of our mouth but we'll meditate on it day and night Lord help us to retain the very scriptures the things that will secure us and strengthen us and Father we pray for this world that has a negative 
effect, Lord, just a negative response to the word of God. Some of us have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and maybe even children that the word of God has just a negative effect. Every time we talk about it, they don't want to hear it. There's an uproar. There's a dividing and a division. We pray, God, that we can deliver the word of God to those people. that have just a negative response to the word of God. And Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to have uh, Trish come and we'll sing a verse of invitation. If you want to sing along.